in a country town in Texas and loves driving his pickup truck but for years and years he knew not to stop outside this certain cornfield. The field seemed to stretch for miles and miles and he dreaded a day he would run out of fuel if he had no choice in the matter to stop. When he drove past the cornfield he tried not to look into it as if that would stop anything strange from happening. But he knew that if he didn't stop, then nothing should happen. The worst about this story is no one said actually what would happen if you did stop. But his imagination was running wild any time he had to drive past it. There were a few stories about the field and different things happening different folk. But he didn't really dwell on them and pretended at least to not believe them. But one night during October he had to make a pickup for his job and had to drive past the field. He no doubt wasn't looking forward to it, but it was his job, his livelihood. He had the gas checked and it was full, so there would be no problem there. While he was driving his pickup truck past the cornfield, he noticed something up ahead. He hoped it was nothing sinister, as he drove closer he realised. There was a car crashed on the road with three people lying in pools of blood near it. But when he looked out the window, he realised one person was alive looking up at him, no doubt pleading with him to stop and help them. He felt awful passing the person and others, but knew he couldn't stop. He didn't want to stop, so he drove on. As he looked in the truck mirror, he could see the three people standing on the road, looking at his truck. He froze in fear and pressed the gas pedal and drove faster and faster, but the cornfield seemed to go on and on even more than usual. Then all of a sudden, it was like dead people walked out of the cornfield and stood right in front of him on the road. He decided to drive past them, there was no way he was stopping. Then suddenly there was a knock on Tim's door, which woke him out of his dream. When he answered the door, the sheriff was standing on the doorstep and said, I'm very sorry to break this news to you Tim, but your daughter unfortunately has been involved in a car accident out by the cornfield. I'm very sorry but she didn't make it, and two of her friends were in the car also. One has survived. Tim couldn't believe what he was hearing and was in a daze. The sheriff said, Tim, are you okay? Tim was wondering was this still a dream. Then he felt drowsy and looked up. He was still on the road, near the cornfield. He checked the mirror and looked behind him, hoping this was still a dream. He walked back to see who the dead people on the road were. And he looked down at himself, his daughter, and his daughter's friend. He then realized he was dead. Susan loved riding her horse around the countryside and also took part in equestrian events. She loved the feeling of the air run through her hair as she felt free as a bird. There was a silly story going around her town about a phantom horse. It's been around for years. The story is, there was meant to be this horse that has bright red eyes and was roaming through the fields, stuck between this world and the next. The horse was meant to have been killed during a race and was looking for a girl to take its owner's place. Needless to say, no one she knew has ever came across this so-called phantom horse. But as sinister as that sounds, that wasn't what bothered her. It started just last week. Susan received a nasty phone call. She didn't speak, she just listened because it was so weird. There was a weird voice spoke that said, Hello Susan, 
I would like to become friends with you. She didn't even ask who it was and just hung up. Then the next day, another call came. Hello, Susan. Why are you playing hard to get? I just want to be friends with you. She didn't bother tell her friends yet, and she suspected maybe it was them who was just playing a trick on her. But it was on a Friday night Susan really got frightened about what was happening. The phone rang, and the weird voice on the other end said, Susan, you are really, really annoying me. I told you I just wanted to be friends. I am losing my patience. Susan felt a shiver run up her and turned the phone off. She told her friends the next day in school. They told her to go to the police. That night when Susan finally had the courage to turn her phone back on, there were loads of messages. 1. Susan, I told you I just wanted to be friends. Now you have really, really annoyed me by your rejection. 2. Susan, why is it you won't answer my phone? 3. Susan, I am very, very angry. 4. Susan, meet me in the horse riding club by the stables at 3 tomorrow. This was it. Susan finally had a plan. She rang her best friend Lucy to tell the others to hide back in the trees while she met her stalker, and they would pounce out and keep him safe until the police arrived. Or better yet, she thought, have the police there wait with her friends. When the time came, Susan walked to the stables, knowing her friends and the police were watching from the trees. She saw some movement over by a horse box. Then she panicked when she saw a black figure come from around it and push her in. Her friends heard a scream and ran up to the horse box. But the worst was to come when they opened it. There was no sign of Susan, and she was never ever to be seen again. People have put it down to the phantom horse, because there was no way out that they would not have seen her. So she must have disappeared. Some nights people have said they had heard a girl crying in the woods, and they had put it down to Susan, caught between this world and the next with the phantom horse that finally found the girl to replace his owner. It was a hot summer's day and three school friends met after 10 years. They were both told during a phone call they had to meet someone for something urgent. They didn't worry if it was some maniac because it was in the middle of the city, outside the mall. So they couldn't really do anything without there being loads of witnesses. When the three men realized they all got the same phone call, they thought it to be a bit weird, wondering who would want to say something urgent to three school friends. It was 2pm and they were meant to be meeting the person at 2, so they expected them any minute. The three friends didn't bother try to catch up in old times. They were more interested in who it was wanted to see them and why. Another five minutes passed and no one was turning up. Then suddenly a car rushed up onto the footpath where they were standing and knocked them over, killing them. If they weren't dead instantly, they would be gone before they'd reached the hospital with the speed and impact the car hit the three men with. Passersby started screaming at the carnage on the road as the car sped by and went up the street, out of sight. Jason, Mike and Sam were bullying Paul in school. This was going on for weeks. Jason said to Paul in a mocking way, You can't even walk to school, you baby. You have to get your mommy to walk you to school because you're too afraid to walk yourself, you big baby. Paul was eight and his mom used to walk him to school every day. Paul used to like it but told his mom eventually that the boys were bullying him. Paul's mom wanted to confront the boys but Paul pleaded with her not to as it would only make things a lot worse he told her. 
He told his mom he wanted to walk to school on his own. He was eight and he should be allowed. All this time Paul loved his mom walking him to school, but only pleaded to be able to walk alone to stop the bullying. Paul's mom gave in and allowed him to walk to school. Paul was walking to school, hoping Jason, Mike and Sam would see him and know that he can of course walk to school on his own. He crossed the road to school but didn't see a car and the car hit Paul and killed him instantly. Paul's mom was unconsolable for weeks and at the funeral she could see the boys standing across knowing what Paul was worried about and that was the reason he wanted to walk to school alone. She told herself, I'll get my revenge on ye someday. You can guarantee I'll get my revenge.